fact is that these long-lived antibodies, which have high specificity, of course, for the, for the, for the virus, they outcompete our natural antibodies. That makes absolutely no sense. Hey, Dr. Wilson here. I'm a molecular and structural biologist, and I'm back to debunk some more COVID-19 misinformation. And this week, by popular demand, I'll be debunking Dr. Gert Vanden Bosch. Dr. Basha has recently gone viral with his interview about COVID-19, and many people think that he has a point, and he does a good job of sounding scientific and sounding very credible, but when you really dig into his claims, they make absolutely no sense at all. And that is what I'm saying really about the current vaccines. I mean, it's just brilliant people who have been making these vaccines in no time and with regulatory approval and everything. So the weapon in itself is excellent. The question is, is this the right weapon for the kind of war that is going on right now? And there my answer is definitely no. So Dr. Basha is one of the latest people that COVID deniers have been spreading around in order to support the idea that the COVID vaccines are actually bad. But interestingly, he says that the COVID vaccines are fine, but we still shouldn't use them? It's a really unique take. Because these are prophylactic vaccines and prophylactic vaccines uh, should typically not be administered to people who are exposed to high infectious pressure. So don't forget we are administering these vaccines in the heat of a pandemic. Well, that's the point. Vaccines are meant to stop the spread of disease, regardless at what stage a epidemic or pandemic is in. This is how vaccines have historically been used. They've been used at times where diseases are widespread, and then the prevalence of that disease goes way down. And every single time, I mean, this is textbook knowledge, every single time you have uh, an immune response that is suboptimal in the presence of an infection, in the presence of a virus that infects that person, you are at risk for immune escape. So that means that the virus can escape to the immune response. Okay, so the concern here is the emergence of new and more infectious strains of SARS-CoV-2. That's a valid concern. He even partially gets this right by saying that he's concerned about the virus evading the immune system and then becoming more infectious. That's exactly how we think some of the newer variants of SARS-CoV-2 actually emerged. We think that immunocompromised patients, patients who have no immune systems, actually play a pivotal role in the emergence of these new variants. That's because there's no immune system to clear the virus. The virus is able to just exist in that host and continue replicating and building up more and more mutations. And because then you provide within a very short period of time the, the population with high antibody titers, so the virus comes under enormous pressure. I mean, that, that wouldn't matter if you can eradicate the virus, if you can prevent infection. But these vaccines don't prevent infection. They protect against disease. The problem with Dr. Bosha is that vaccines are the exact solution to that concern. The whole point of a vaccine is to stop the pathogen in its tracks so that when your body encounters it, it can eliminate the pathogen before it has a chance to replicate a lot and cause disease in you. And that's exactly what we see COVID-19 vaccines doing. They do prevent disease in people and early preliminary evidence suggests that it reduces the overall viral load of people who still come into contact with the virus. That means the virus is not replicating as much in these people and it's not gonna be able to spread as easily. Again, these results are preliminary, but they are pretty promising and saying that COVID vaccines do not prevent transmission as if it's true and we've tested it is just premature and false. It's as equivalent to using either a partial dose of antibiotics in an antimicrobial or in a bacterial infection where you then produce superbugs. Is this the kind of example that you're alluding to? Well, that is a very good parallel. But what about this point he makes about partially vaccinated people. How if you're vaccinating in the midst of a pandemic and you come into contact with the virus before you fully develop immunity, well, that's either going to be slightly better than no immunity at all, or just the same as no immunity at all. 
being partially vaccinated is not going to somehow help the virus replicate in your body. That just doesn't make any sense. He has this whole analogy about using antibiotics and this vaccine being akin to antibiotics, such that we're going to create superbugs or super versions of SARS-CoV-2 that are resistant to the vaccine. Now, this view is not accurate because the more we use the vaccine, the more people get vaccinated, the harder time the virus is going to have replicating in the human population, and the harder time it's going to have forming new successful variants. So all this is to say that yes, this concern of new variants emerging is a concern, but the solution is vaccination. Even if we do encounter a SARS-CoV-2 variant that can evade the vaccines, we can easily produce a new vaccine. It would just be like getting a booster shot every year for the flu, and it would mean that we can avoid lockdowns, avoid having to social distance, and get closer and closer back to the normal lives that we all want. So no, vaccines are not increasing the likelihood of new variants of SARS-CoV-2 emerging. And the current vaccines do show some effectiveness against the current variants. So really, if we want to stop the spread and thus the chances for new variants to emerge, then get vaccinated. That is the answer. Fact is that these long-lived antibodies, which have high specificity, of course, for the, for the, for the virus, they outcompete our natural antibodies. That makes absolutely no sense. If he's talking about antibodies specific to SARS-CoV-2 outcompeting non-specific antibodies, then yes, that happens, and that's what we want. We want antibodies to specifically and strongly recognize SARS-CoV-2 so that our immune systems can mount an immune response as quickly as possible. So I don't get why he would be concerned about that. But if he's talking about specific antibodies somehow being produced more often than antibodies that would better detect a different variant, then that doesn't make any sense either. That's because those specific antibodies aren't really going to be ramped up in production unless we encounter that specific SARS-CoV-2 variant that the antibody is meant to recognize. Here's how this works. Whenever you have immune memory against a specific pathogen, part of that memory is stored in B cells, which are stored in immune organs, such as lymph nodes and the spleen. These memory B cells are going to produce antibodies that remember or specifically recognize that pathogen. But it's only when those antigens that the antibodies recognize are brought to the immune organ, such as the lymph nodes or the spleen, and shown to that memory B cell, does it start to clonally expand and ramp up antibody production. So if you don't have that antigen, the antibody production is not going to be ramped up. And if you have a different antigen, say from a newer SARS-CoV-2 variant that the previous antibody doesn't recognize, then a naive B cell is going to be the one that clonally expands and tries to start mounting that primary immune response that will now be towards this new variant. This whole idea of antibody production competing in the body and somehow messing with our immunity, it just makes no sense. And I really hope people are not taking Dr. Bosch seriously because what he's saying here does not check out. You can definitely dive way deeper into immunology than what I say in this video. It's one of the most fascinating topics in all of biology, and I encourage you to do so. So I'm going to put some links in the description that you can go to to help learn more if you're interested. Well, that's going to do it for this week. That was certainly the most unique COVID denier that I've debunked so far. And yes, I do consider him a COVID denier because he's denying the science of COVID and vaccines. Hopefully you found this video useful, and as always, all of the links to all of the science and information that I talk about and more are linked in the description below so that you can go check it out for yourself. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you to all of those who showed support for my last video on RFK Jr. and donated to the Autistic Self Advocacy Network. It is greatly appreciated, and I'm very happy to see that. Thanks again for watching, and don't forget to subscribe so that you can catch me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then.